my name is Yaroslav Halchinka and I'm talking to you from Dartmouth about DataLab project. Uh, this project was initiated by me and Michael Hanke from Germany and we had successful few years of collaboration. Before that you might know uh, about us about because of all our other projects such as PyMVP and NeuroDev and I hope that you use them and they help you in your research projects. More about these and other projects you could discover if you go to centerforopenneuroscience.org website where you could also find contacts uh, for us in social media. And before I proceed with the talk I want first of all acknowledge work of others on the project. It wasn't only my and Michael's work uh, uh, our project is heavily based on Git Annex tool, which Joey has wrote for managing his own collection of files, which has nothing to do with science. And uh, also he is well known for his work in Debian project. We had, we ha still have tireless workers on the project, uh, Benjamin uh, working with Michael and Alex. Alex recently refurbished or wrote from scratch a new version of the website. I hope that you'll like it and we'll see a little bit more of it uh, later. Also, we had Jason DeBangem and Gergana working on the project, and um, they were quite successful to accomplish a lot within a short period of time. Uh, so if you're looking for a project to contribute to, it might be the interesting project for you to start working on open source projects and leaving kind of your footstep in the um, ecosystem of open source for neuroscience. This project is supported by NSF, and um, Federal Ministry for Education and Research in Germany. If you go to open, near, open Center for Open Neuroscience.org, you could discover more interesting and exciting projects we either collaborate with or contribute to. Before we proceed, I want actually to formulate the problem we are trying to solve with DataLab. Data is second-class citizen within software platforms. What could that potentially be? One of the aspects is, if you look how people distribute data nowadays, quite often you find that uh, even large arrays of data are distributed in tarballs or zip files. Problems are multiple with these ways of distribution. If one file changes, you need to re-redistribute re entire tarball, which might be gigabytes uh, in, in size. And that's why, partially, we also couldn't just adopt uh, technologies which are uh, proven to work for software, let's say in Debian we distribute complete packages, but again the problem is the same. As long as you force uh, wrapping all the data together in some big file, it wouldn't work, it wouldn't scale. Uh, also another problem is absent version of data. And many people actually underappreciate it and think that it doesn't actually exist or relates to their um, way of work. But no, actually the, this problem is quite generic. So if you look into this PhD comics caricature, you'll find that this probably relates to many um, ways how you deal with files, data, or documents. Um, and you could see that actually how we tend to version our data is to, by providing quite often the date, right, which creates some kind of linear progression. Right? So we annotate that, oh, uh, I've worked on these in those dates, but also maybe a little bit later. And we try to annotate it with some description of what was maybe done to the data. Right? So uh, in this case, it was a test run, then we test it again, then we calibrate it, and then we ran into a problem. Right? So all these kind of, you save the result of your work and annotate it, so later on you could either get back to the previous state, let's say maybe you indeed made an error and you want to roll back, or maybe you want to just compare what have you done which broke your code or data, right? And as you could see, those messages could be quite descriptive. But the problem is that version control systems which are created for code are in that inadequate for data, right? So the problem is quite often that it's duplication, you have copy of the data in the version control system inside somewhere so you couldn't use it directly, but also it's present on your hard drive, so at least you have two copies quite often. Or maybe it's duplicated and just on a single server, right? 
And I could give you examples where data in a version control system filled up the version control system and meanwhile filling up the hard drive. And sometimes you try to commit new file and apparently you run out of space on the server and it might ruin your version control back on the, on the server, rendering it impossible to get to the previous version. So you don't want to have that, right? Um, then another problem is that there were no generic data distributions, or at least there were no before data led. So there is no efficient ways to uh, install and upgrade data sets. And when you also deal with different data hosting portals, you need to learn how to navigate them, right? You need to learn how you authenticate, how you, which page you need to go to and what to download and how to download it. So just to get to that data set. And then maybe you uh, get announcement that data set was fixed and you need to repeat this over and over again, trying to remember how to deal with it. And I'm not talking even if a website became much better and slicker and changed all the ways how it actually deals with downloads from what it did before. Uh, another aspect that data is rarely tested. So what does it mean for data to have bugs? Any derived data is a product of running a script or some kind of procedure on original data and generating new derived data. Uh, quite prominent ones, which you could find in references later on in this presentation, is atlases. So atlases usually produce from the data writing some really sophisticated script, which generates new data, the atlas. And those atlases could be buggy. So how do you test the data? The same way as software. If we could establish this efficient process where we uh, produce some data and verify that at least data meets the assumptions which you expect. If it's population or probability in the area which must be present in the entirety of population, then all probabilities should add up to 100 or nearby to 100. If it doesn't add up, then you have a bug. It's really simple assumption, but verif verifying that your data doesn't have, doesn't break those is really important and unified way how we deal with data and the code could help to establish those te data testing procedures. Also, it's quite difficult to share newer derived data. You've downloaded some data set from a well-known portal. How do you share it? What data could be shared? Uh, where do you deposit it? So people later on could download maybe original data and your derived data without even worrying that, oh, they need to get this piece from the original source and your derived data from another place. So how do we link those pieces together to make it convenient? What we are trying to achieve is to make managing of the data as easy as managing code and software. Is it possible? I hope that you'll see that it is so. So what data led is based on is on two pieces. And one of them is Git. I hope that everybody knows what Git is. Uh, but I'll give small presentation nevertheless. So Git is a version control system. And initially it was developed to manage Linux project code. If somebody doesn't know what Linux is, this is one of the most recognized and probably mostly used because it's used everywhere on the phones, on the servers, on the desktops, operating systems. It's free and open source and it's developed in the open. And at some point they needed new version control system which would scale for the demand of having lots of code managed there and many people working with it. So it's not a geeky project just for uh, between few people. It is developed by hundreds, it's used by millions. What's great about Git is that it's distributed. So content is available across all copies of the repository. If you clone the repository, you have the entire history of the project and you could get to any point in that development, you could compare different versions, you could do exactly the same things as original developers did on this repository. So it provides you as much flexibility to accomplish things locally uh, without requiring uh, any network access. And Git became a backbone for GitHub and other social coding portals. So GitHub, 
you have came to fill the niche that there were no convenient online resource where people could easily share these repositories and work on them together. So Git is just a tool and GitHub is just a web portal which provides you a convenient uh, centralized management of the repositories and collaboration between people. But it's not a single one. There is other uh, systems which use uh, Git underneath. GitLab, uh, Bitbucket. So uh, it just creates this the entire ecosystem of the tool and additional services and resources. What Git is great for is very efficient management of textual information, right? So if you manage code, text, configuration files, maybe dump, uh, some documentation or JSON files. So all of those are nicely managed by Git because it has really good mechanism to annotate the differences and compress that efficiently. So all those distributed copies are actually uh, not that big. But the problem or inefficiency of Git is this exactly distributed nature of it, that it stores all the copies of the documents on all the systems, right? So if we have big files, then it becomes inefficient because now you will have two copies, right? You will have one on your hard drive, at least two copies, one on your hard drive, and then one committed into Git. And then if you push this into GitHub, you have again a big copy of that file somewhere and anybody who clones that repository might wait for a while to just get it and then they will um, might be a little bit upset because they wanted just one file from the repository and didn't care to download a gigabyte uh, of data just to see it. So it's inefficient for storing data. What is the other tool we rely on is, as I said, written by Joy Has. It's Git Annex. So the idea was to build on top of Git to provide management for the data files without committing those files directly into Git. So Git Annex allows you to add data files under Git control without committing the content of the files into Git. And while playing with Git Annex and Datalet, you might see that files get replaced with a symlink. So what Git Annex commits into Git is actually just a symlink, which points to the file which conta contains the data. This way you can commit really lightweight symlink and keep the data on a hard drive in a single copy. So it, it's not in the Git. And then what Git Annex does, it orchestrates the management of those files between different clones of the repository or so-called other way special remotes. But also it provides access to those files if they are, let's say, uploaded onto some website. So you have a URL. You could associate the URL with the file. You could upload it to FTP, you could upload it to web dev server. You could even get content through BitTorrent or you could use Amazon S3 storage as your container for the files. And it allows for custom extensions. Let's say you could uh, upload data to Dropbox, Google Drive, Box.com, and many, many other uh, data hosting providers. And Git Annex takes care also about avoiding the limitations of those platforms. Let's say box.com for public account, it doesn't allow you to have files larger than, I believe, 100 megabytes. Git Annex will chop it up. So on the box.com, you will have little pieces. You will not use them directly from box.com. But then Git Annex will reassemble the big file when it gets it onto your hard drive. So all those conveniences and in addition encryption, let's say if you want to share some sensitive data and you cannot just upload it unencrypted to the public service. All those are provided by Git Annex. Also additional feature which we don't use in the project is uh, Git Annex Assistant, which is Dropbox-like synchronization mechanism. You could establish synchronization between your Git Git Annex repositories across multiple servers and configure them really flexibly. So you have, let's say, backup of, on the of all the data files on one server and some other server will have only files which it cares about, let's say, data files. Another one might have only video files. Uh, another one maybe just music files. 
who knows so flexibility is there and it's all up to you to configure what you want where in our project we didn't use it yet but we do use it locally for synchronizing different uh, GitHub repositories. But another problem here, so we have really great two tools, Git and Git Annex, but both of them work on a single repository level. So to work in a Git repository, you need to go into that directory and accomplish whatever you want to do, right? It kind of doesn't go along well with the notion of distribution. You don't care where you are, you just want to, on your hard drive, right? So you just want to say, oh, search, find me something, install this, and give me access to this data, right? Or get me, give me this file, even though maybe I'm not in that Git or Git Annex repository. Also, another kind of aspect, those are just tools. So similarly, like how GitHub provided convenient portal to the tool Git, uh, we want to accomplish something where we use these tools, which are agnostic of the main of the data, let's say in your imaging, to give you guys access to those terabytes of publicly shared data already, which lives out there somewhere. So we don't need to collect it. We don't need to make copy of it locally, right? It's already there. So what we want to achieve is just to provide access to the, that data without mirroring it on our servers or without duplicating it elsewhere. And before going into demos, I want to give you kind of more illustrative maybe demo of what is data life cycle here of data uh, which we provide by data lab. Let's imagine that we have a data set which comes initially from OpenFMRI, right? And lives somewhere in the cloud or on data hosting portal. Actually, we have two copies of the data. One of them might be in the tarball, somewhere on HTTP server, right? And another one might be extracted from the tarball somewhere on the cloud, which might have HTTP access, might have S3 access, but the point is the data is there. And then we have a data user, and that's us, right? Me, you, everybody who wants to use this data. So now options are we either go download the tarball, extract it, or we learn how to use S3 and go and install some tool, browse S3 bucket, download those files. Uh, but what we are trying to establish here is actually middle layer, right? So we want to provide data distribution, which might be hosted somewhere. Maybe it's on GitHub, maybe on our server where we'll take this data available online and we'll automatically crawl it. So here I mentioned this command crawl, which is one of the commands Datalet provides to automate monitoring of external resources. So we could get them into Git repositories. And actually you could see here that these greenish yellows, oh, why you don't draw here, greenish yellow color why you don't draw here? Here we go. So this greenish yellow color represents just a content reference instead of the actual content. That's why we could host it on GitHub or anywhere because it doesn't have the actual data. So we collect those data sets into collections, which we might share, let's say, the one which we share from data sets that data led that work, right? And underneath we use Git modules, which is built in mechanism within Git to organize these collections of multiple repositories while keeping track of versioning information. So you could get the entire collection, let's say, of open from right data sets for a specific date, for a specific version, if you want to reproduce somebody else's analysis. And then we are making it possible to install arbitrary number of those data sets we are a unified interface. So here we mentioned command data let install, which you'll see later. And hopefully uh, those parameters like install into current data set and get all the data will be less surprising. And also we provide shortcuts, so which I'll talk about later. But the point is that you could now easily install those data sets onto your local hard drive. And if you're doing some processing, you might add results of your process. In this case, we've got new file, filtered bold file, which we could easily add into this repository, and which means we just commit it into the repository under Git Annex control. And later, 
we could publish this entirety of maybe collection of the data sets to multiple places. One of them might be GitHub, where we publish only the repository itself without actually data files. Again, those are just symlinks. And maybe offload the actual data to some server, which might be HTTP server, or uh, some other server through some mechanism, right? But the point is the data goes somewhere and the magic happens here thanks to the Git Annex because that's the beast which keeps track of where each data file could be obtained from. So these red links point to the information of what Git Annex stores for us that, oh, let's say this bold file is available from original map portal, right? It's available from a stream bucket. It might be coming from a tarball. So that's one of the extensions we added to Gitanix to support extraction of the files from the tarball. And um, so it becomes really transparent to the user. And this new file, we published it there. So it might be available now through HTTP. So people who clone this repository would be able to get any file from original storage or from any derived data which we published on our website. So that's kind of the main idea be behind DataLed. Uh, so altogether, DataLed allows you to manage multiple repositories organized into these super data sets, which are just collection of Git repositories, using standard Git submodules mechanism. It supports both Git and Gitanix repositories. So if you have just regular Git repositories where you don't want to add any data, it's perfectly fine. And we can crawl external online data resources and update Git Annex repositories upon changes. It seems to scale quite nicely because data stays with original data providers. So we don't need to increase the storage on our server. And we could use maybe, or you could use, because anybody could use DataLed to publish their collections of the data sets on GitHub and maybe offload in data itself to portals like box.com or Dropbox. And what happens now that we have unified access to data regardless of its origin, right? You don't care if data comes from OpenFMRI or CRCNS. The only difference might be that you need to authenticate. Let's say CRCNS doesn't allow download without authentication. Authentication, so data that will ask you for credentials, which it will store locally on the hard drive, nothing is shared with us. And later on, when you need to get more data, it just will use those credentials to authenticate on your behalf to CRCNS, download those tarballs, extract it for you, so you don't need to worry about that. And also, we take care about serialization. So if original website distributes only tarballs, we download tarballs for you, extract them, and again, you don't need to worry how the data is actually serialized by original data provider. What we do on top is to we aggregate metadata. What metadata is, is a data about data. So let's say you have a data set which contains the data. There is also information about what this data set is about, what its name, what, it, what its author, authors, uh, what might be the license if it's applicable. So any additional information about the data constitutes metadata. What we do in DataLet, we aggregate metadata which we find about the original data sets and provide you a convenient interface so you could search across all of it, across all the data sets which we already integrated in DataLed. And I hope you'll see the demonstration uh, quite appealing later on. And then DataLed, after you consumed, added, extended data sets or just created from scratch, you could share original or derived data sets publicly, as I mentioned, or internally. You could always publish them locally uh, via SSH, maybe to collaborate with somebody, and that's what we do regularly. And meanwhile, we'll keep data, we could keep data available elsewhere. Or you could even share the data set without sharing the data, which is quite keen as a um, demonstration of good intent when you are about to publish the paper. That's what we did with our recent submission. We published the data set but not with the entirety of the data set, but just with first subject. So reviewers could verify that there is good quality data, that um, they could get access to it, right? 
and that the entirety of data is in principle available and it was processed accordingly because the whole the entire git uh, history is maintained and shared but the data files are not okay and the additional benefit uh, some of it which is work in progress uh, you could export the data sets if you want to share just the data itself you could export the data set in current version in a tarball and give it to somebody but more exciting feature which uh, we've been working on is exporting into some metadata heavy data formats if you are to publish in scientific data you will be asked to fill out a big spreadsheet which is called isatap um, to annotate metadata for your data set it's really tedious and unpleasant job but the beauty is that all that information is contained within metadata of either data set or of git annex so we could automatically export majority of information for you so you just need to fill out left out left out information and be done data that comes with both common line and python interfaces so you could work with it interactively either in common line or scripted in bash or working with it interactively in the ipython and scripted with python language it gives you the same capabilities and really similar syntax our distribution grew up already to cover over 10 terabytes of data we cover such data sets as open fMRI CRCNS uh, functional connectome uh, indie data sets and even some data sets from Kaggle uh, some red hole radio podcast show because it was a cool experiment to be able to crawl that website and collect all the data about timing of the songs so check it out it's available on github although data stays as again with original provider what is coming more data so we'll cover human connectome project and data available from xnet servers we want to provide extended metadata support so we cover not only data sets level data but also data for separate files if you know not any other interesting data set or data provider uh, file a new issue or give us an email or shoot us an email we are also working on integrating with NeuroDebian so you could up get install those data sets and the position of data to uh, OSF and in other platforms another interesting integration which we've done was to introduce data led support into HUDICONF which stands for heuristical DICOM conversion tool which allows you to uh, automate conversion of your DICOM data which you obtained from MRI scanner into nifty files but we went uh, one step further and standardized it to convert not only to data led data sets but data led bits data sets so if you don't know what bits is is something you must know nowadays if you do in your imaging research it's brain imaging data structure format which describes how you should lay out your files on the file system so anybody who finds your data set will be immediately capable to understand uh, your design how many subjects you have so uh, it standardizes beyond nifty it standardizes how you work with your files so now with this integration in hudiconf we can update, obtain data led data sets with bitsified neuroimaging data so it's ready to be shared it's ready to be processed by any bit compatible tool so it opens ample uh, opportunities and at this point i guess we should switch and do some demos and before i actually give any demo i want to familiarize you with our new website at datalet.org uh, on top you could see navigation for among major portions of the website one of them is about page it just describes the purpose of the data lab and provides uh, information about funding agencies and involved institutions next link is get data lab which describes how to install the data how to install data lab the easiest installation is if you are using your Devin already then it's just up get install data led command or you could find it in package manager and install it within seconds alternatively if you are on os 10 or any other operating system windows su support is initial but it m should work uh, in the basic set of features you have to install git annex by 
go into Gitanex website and go into install page choosing the operating system of your choice and following the instructions there how to get it and after you installed Gitanex you just need to install datalet from python package index through pip install datalet command next page is features page which is actually uh, led to by those pretty boxes on the main page and this page will go through uh, later in greater detail another interesting page is datasets which presents you our ultimate official distribution which points to datasets.datalet.org which is the collection of datasets which already pre-crawled for you and that's where we provide those data sets like for open fMRI, CRCNS, AD, HDHD, and many others. Um, let me just briefly describe you the feature set of this basic website and mention that the, such websites, if you have any HTTP server available somewhere, maybe an institution provides, because you will not host the data actually here, or you don't have to, um, you could upload similar views of your data sets Pretty much anywhere where you could host a website and open from right let's say we go to open from right it lists all those data sets which we crawled from open from right you could see also immediately mentioning of the version here and version goes uh, from what version open from right gave it but also with additional indices pointing to exactly exact commit uh, within our git repository uh, i didn't find that version another neat feature here is uh, immediate uh, search so you could start typing i don't know if you're interested in resting state so here we go it goes uh, pre pretty fast and limits the view only to the data sets where metadata uh, mentions this word let's say let's look for hexby there we go or let's look for movie there we go so you could quickly identify the data sets by uh, via browsing and we'll see how we could do such actions later in the common line and when you get to the data set of interest or it could be at any pretty much level you'll see on top the command which could be used to install this data set and describing some options let's say dash r is to install this data set with any possible sub data set in it recursively dash g to install it and also obtain all the data for it and if you want to speed up the uh, obtaining the data you could use dash capital J and specify the number of parallel downloads you, your server and bandwidth could allow you okay let's go back to data and website and another um, page on the website is development so if you're interested to help and uh, contribute data sets, provide uh, patches, improve documentation, all of the development is, ma is made in open. We use GitHub intensively, we use Travis, we use CodeCov, uh, we use um, read the docs for documentation. So, and that will be our next point. Uh, documentation is hosted on docs.datalab.org and it provides uh, not yet as thorough documentation as we wanted but some data set, uh, some documentation about major features of the data set or let's say comparison between git git annex and data Lab. but it also provides really thorough interface documentation so uh, as i mentioned before we have common line and python um, interfaces both of those interfaces generated from the same code so they should be pretty much identical it just depending on how you use common line or python it will be different but otherwise all the options all the commands they look exactly the same and in common line reference you could find all the um, documentation for all the commands you could see that i have some popular ones in my case right where i went before and it provides documentation what those and of course there is nodes for power users and quite elaborate documentation here about all the options which are available to the um, in, in those commands okay so let's go back to features and first of the demos which I want to show you 
will be about data discovery. As any other demo on the website, it is provided with um, screencast, which shows all necessary commands uh, to carry out the um, presentation, but also provides you with comments describing uh, the purpose uh, of the actions taken. Moreover, um, you could obtain the full script for the demo, so you could run it uh, as is on your hardware. Um, by clicking underneath the screen uh, screencast but for this demonstration I'll do it interactively in a shell together with you so uh, let's get started and if as you remember um, we aggregate a lot of metadata in the data in data lab to provide efficient search mechanisms um, in this example We'll imagine that we are looking for a data set which mentions Raiders in its word after um, being associated with a movie Raiders of the Lost Ark and Neuroimaging. Um, so we'll use data let search command where we'll um, just state it, right? So we'll call data let search Raiders Neuroimaging. As with uh, many or all commands in data let, they are composed by uh, calling data let then type in the command you want to implement, right? And then you could ask for help for that command, um, which provides you with um, associated help. And on my screen, it took a little bit longer just because of video recording. Usually it's a little bit faster, like five times. And then you actually type the uh, parameters for this command. For search, it's actually search terms, and I'll present a few other options later on. Whenever you start this command for the first time, it will ask you to install our super data set uh, under your home data land. In my case, that slash demo is the home directory, so it asks either we want to install that super data set which you saw available on datasets that datalab.org in your home directory and that's what it's doing so it quickly installed it because it's just a small git repository without any of those data sets directly being a part of it but they are linked to it as sub modules that's why it was really fast and then it loads and caches uh, metadata which became available in that data set and that takes few seconds Whenever that is done, it, you see that by re default, it just returns the paths or names of the um, data sets as they are within the hierarchy of our super data set. And um, search searches within the repository or data set you're in. So if next time I am just running the same command, it will ask me instead of, oh, do you want to install it? will ask me either I want to search in this super data set which I installed in my home directory. And I type yes. Um, and it provides the same result. So to avoid such interactive questions, you could uh, explicitly mention which data set you want to search in. And in our case, it will be, we'll just specify uh, that data set will be this canonical uh, data lab data set which is installed in your uh, data lab directory. When you specify it like this, it assumes location in your home directory. When you use triple slashes resource identifier as the source for uh, URLs to, um, to install the data sets, then it will go to datasets.datalab.org. And this time we will search uh, not for Raiders near imaging, but we'll search for Hagsby to be one of the authors within this data set. Uh, so dash S stands for the fields which we want to search through and dash capital R will report now not just the paths to the data sets but also list the fields which match the uh, query which we ran. So in this case it should search for data sets and report the field uh, author um, and only the data sets where Hagsby was one of the authors. So here they are. 
for convenience, let's just switch to that directory um, under our home. Uh, let me clean, clear the screen and uh, go to that directory. So now we don't have to specify location of the data set explicitly, and we could just type the same query without dash D, and it will provide the same results. Instead of listing all matching fields, let's say in our case it was author field, right? We could explicitly specify which fields we want to search through, let's say, if we, or to report. Um, so in this case, I want to see what's the name of the data set and what is the author of the data set. So we saw already the author, but we didn't see the name. Um, and you run the command to get the output with those fields included. Well, enough of searching. So let's clear the screen. And what we could do now, we found the data sets, right? It seems to be that the list of data sets which we found um, is good to be installed. And we could just rely on uh, in a paradigm of Linux where you compose commands together through uh, by using pipe command. So what this magic would do, if we didn't have these, we saw already what happens, right? So we get only the list of data sets or paths to those which are not installed yet. Right? So open from my directory is still empty. So we get the list of data sets, but then instead of manually going and doing data let install open it from right df 00233 or doing copy paste, we could just say that result of this command should be passed as arguments to the next command, which will be data let install. So data let install command installs those data sets which are either specified by the path within current data set, or you could provide URLs to uh, install command and it will go to those websites and download them explicitly from there. So data let install could be used with other resources be beyond our canonical uh, data let distribution. So let's run this command. And as a result of it, you'll see that now it goes online and installs all those data sets or git, git annex repositories without any data yet. So only the files which are were committed directly into git will be present. And now we could explore what actually we have got here. I'll use another data let command. Let me clear the screen to bring it on top of the screen. So next command is ls, which just lists uh, either data sets, or it could be used also to list S3 URLs if you're uh, interested to see what is available in S3 bucket. And we are specifying the options at capital L for long listing and R recursively. So it will go through all data sets locally in current directory. That's why there is a period. And then we'll just remove a uh, listing of data sets which are not installed because they're not of our interest here. So as you can see, all those data sets which we initially searched for and found, right, um, they became installed, right? So they became available on our uh, local file system. And alas gives us idea of what kind of repository it is. It's git versus annex, which branch it is in, what was the date of the last commit, and also the sizes. What it tells here that we have out of four gigabytes of data referenced in this data set at the current version, we've got only zero bytes uh, locally installed. So we installed uh, only uh, those symlinks I was talking about. 
So now we could actually explore uh, what have you got. Some of the files, they were committed directly into Git, so they became available on the file system as is. But data files, we could obtain now using a data let get command. So what this command would do, let me clear the screen again. So we are saying that obtain those files, doing it in parallel, in four parallel uh, processes, all the files which match this um, sh uh, shell glob expression, so all the data sets locally which we have, for all the subjects underneath and anatomical directory, right? So we obtained already two open fMRI data sets, and now we just want to obtain those data files. Let's actually see what this one is pointing to. So it points to all those data files, and if we li list it uh, with lon, um, listing, we'll see that those are symlinks, which are actually at the moment not even present on there, pointing to the files which we don't have locally. And that's what Git Annex would do for us. It would go online and fetch all those files uh, from wherever they are available. So let me run this command now. As you can see, there is four processes going on. At the end, uh, all data led commands, they provide you a summary of what was, uh, what, what actions did it uh, take. And here you could see that it got all those files, right? Get okay, or it might say get failed if it failed to get them, and then provides action summary, which we might see later in other demos. So let's now run the same command which we ran before to see how much of data we actually got. And as you can see, all those which we didn't ask for any data, they still keep zero bytes, although all the files, they're available and we could browse them, right? But those where we requested additional data files to be obtained, finally list how much data we have in the, work, in the working tree um, of those data sets. Okay, so that would complete the demo for search and install. And now it's your turn to find some interesting for you data sets and get the data for them. Now that we went through one of the demos on our website, or we called it features, which was data discovery, you could go uh, and visit other uh, features described on this page. First one is for data consumers, which describes how you could generate native data-led data sets from the websites or uh, S3 buckets uh, using our crawler. So um, if you know some resource, you could create your own uh, data-led crawler to obtain that data into data-led data sets and keep it up to date with uh, periodic reruns. Data sharing demo will later show uh, examples of how you could share the data either on GitHub, through the GitHub while depositing data to your uh, website how I demonstrated earlier, or just for collaboration through SSH servers. Uh, for Git and Git Annex users, we give a little example of unique features uh, present in DataLad, which compare it uh, in con contrasting it with regular Git and Git Annex usage. This table outlines their, um, those features here that we operate uh, on multiple data sets at, at the same time. We operate across data sets seamlessly, so you don't have to switch directories to just uh, operate in sp with specific data files. We provide metadata support uh, and aggregate from different metadata sources and un unified authentication uh, interface. Also, uh, one of the 
new unique features in Datalet is ability to rerun previously ran commands on the data to see uh, how maybe things changed or just keep nice uh, protocol of actions you have done and record them within your Git Gitanix history. Uh, and the last one goes in detail in example on how to use hudiconf with your data sets and relying on our uh, naming convention for how to name uh, scanning sequences in the scanner. I hope that you like this um, presentation and you liked what Datalet has to offer. So I just want to summarize what Datalet does. And what it does, it helps to manage and share available and your own data via simple common line of Python interface. We provide already access to over 10 terabytes of neuroimaging data and we help with authentication, crawling of the websites, getting data from the archives in which they, it was originally distributed, publishing new or derived data, and underneath, we use regular, pure Git and Gitanix repository. So whatever tools you've got used to use, you could still use them. And if you're an expert Git and Gitanix user, we will not limit your powers. You could do the same stuff what you did before with your Git and Gitanix repositories. So we also provide somewhat human accessible um, metadata interface. So in, in general, if you want just to search for some data sets, it's quite convenient with data-led search. And documentation is growing. Uh, you're welcome to contribute. The project is open source. I hope that after you've seen the presentation, you will agree that managing data can be as simple as managing code and software. Thank you.